Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to Palliative Care Grand Rounds. Um, our speaker this morning is going to be uh, Dr. Mike Landsberg. And um, I just want to tell you a little bit about Mike. Mike's a graduate from uh, Bronx Science and he received his bachelor's degree from Columbia College in New York City, followed by a medical school at Harvard. He returned to Columbia for internal medicine residency in chief year and ultimately a fellowship in adult and pediatric cardiology at uh, Brigham and Women's and Boston Children's Hospital. Um, and Mike has practiced uh, there since that time. Um, Mike was raised in a culture steeped in family and social justice, and he's been married for the past 36 years to his best friend and the smarter doctor, <laughs> the smarter Dr. Landsberg, as he likes to call her. And together they have uh, three kids uh, plus two uh, son, daughter-in-law, um, and um, sorry, and four grandchildren. Mike's interest in bridging the gaps, expanding the intersection between cardiology and palliative medicine, in particular using um, lifelong care of adults with congenital heart disease as a model for exploring and refining systems of chronic palliative care delivery and their impact. Um, I'm gonna editorialize here just a little bit and say, I think um, when Mike came here after his many years of cardiology, we expected to learn cardiology from him. And I think many of us have been really inspired by uh, the bravery and humility to take a massive swerve in someone's uh, career when they're established and comfortable. So um, we've learned a lot from Mike. We look forward to learning from you today and uh, in years to come. So <laughs> welcome, Mike. Thank you very much. Good morning, friends. Uh, good morning, friends here at Mass General. Good morning to our friends over at Dana-Farber, uh, to the folks, some of whom are here from Care Dimensions, to the folks that are listening on the internet. Can people hear me okay? Uh, to my mom who's listening in Queens. Uh, that's not true. She's not. <laughs> um, ho hopefully today will be something that is a little different, uh, is a little bit of fun. It was certainly fun for me to prepare uh, and let's begin together. Take a trip with me. Imagine that you are on a train traveling from point A to point B. It's a little bit old world kind of travel. Uh, you're in a compartment and you are getting closer to your destination. You look around the compartment and there's one other passenger in the compartment. You don't know this person. It's gonna get a little loud for a second. themselves completely, and then as you exit the tunnel, you leave nothing behind. It's a relationship that you see here that in some ways you've come to know and grasp that other person in a fashion that is unbounded. You brought your entire self, no commitment, nothing left behind complete, no leftover emotional involvement, and you've never known that person before. This is the opening chapter in a book that in 1973 excited me to some extent, uh, Fear of Flying by Erica Zhang. And the first chapter was titled Zipless. Uh, Erica used this to describe a sexual encounter, uh, but we're not gonna do that. We're going to use it to describe human interaction for the sake of our discussion, let's say it is a palliative care encounter with all of these attributes. And we're going to spend the next 45 minutes or so exploring if in fact, what was called zipless to Erica Jean can be for us. Can we ever truly have an encounter that is in fact zipless? Full, complete of ourselves, leaving nothing behind encompassing all of us, having this relationship, and then we can walk away unscarred, but filled with growth, 
from ourselves and the other person that we're involved with. Lessons from the science and the practice of empathy. I'm Mike Landsberg. Thank you for coming. Have a nice day. <laughs> the objectives. To identify the spiritual, sociologic, and philosophical examples of relationalism. We'll spend the first block of time talking about what we mean by societal, anthropological, spiritual relationism. How we interact with others and in so defining ourselves. We'll look at the various components uh, of what goes into empathy, examine them, perhaps describe new components that we believe in. And ultimately, we'll contrast and think about those various components of empathy, sympathy, compassion, and see where we as practitioners may be at risk and how to potentially overcome those risks. And I'll leave asking us all the very question that we begin with and leave it open for discussion. I have no particular relationships related to this presentation. The very beginnings of man occurred in several places, to the far right of the globe, perhaps uh, in China, in Asia, uh, in the center of the picture, in the plains of Africa, Tanzania, Olduvai Gorge, and then to the bottom left, perhaps uh, some theorize in South America as well. If we allow some time to pass from Tanzania and early man travel down to South Africa. One of the earliest languages that was developed as civilization progressed was Zulu. And when people greet each other in Zulu, what do they say? I'm sure it's on the tip of all of your tongues. The, the statement is Sabona. Watch my hands here. I see you. How incredible. I grew up in New York. Hey, how you doing? Right? That's how you how you doing? The response is, yeah, whatever. You know, that's a I see you completely. I understand you. I recognize you. I take you in. And this is even the better part. What's the response? Gikona. In your seeing me, you have defined me. You've allowed me to be recognized, and I now exist because of your interaction with me. What an incredible way of greeting each other. It defines us, and the relationship happens immediately, and we give of each other almost completely in terms of our knowing each other. You will never say, hi, how are you doing again? The anthropologic beginnings of relationalism. My fellow fellows have heard me speak about my middle name. My middle name is Job. Uh, and we're going to go to one of the first books of the Bible, perhaps the first written book of the Bible, hence Job. And for those of you that are familiar with Job, bear with me. If you're not as familiar with Job, I will give you the so-called Reader's Digest condensed, condensed version of Job. And these are engravings from William Blake's book on Job is a slightly different story than the one I tell each time, and I'll look at various different aspects. The ending will be different for my co-fellows when, when, we, when we talk about this. So Job is a good man, the story begins. This is before the time where we've developed uh, different monotheistic names of our faith, not Jewish, not Catholic, not Protestant. Job is a good man, and in his goodness, he loves his creator. He believes he knows his creator. And he has great riches. He's got an incredible spouse. He's got sheep and cattle and kids, and he's a happy man. And then the story happens. The creator is pictured there at the top of the screen. The number two person below the creator is the devil. And the two of them are looking down, and the, and the creator, God, says to the devil, my man Job down there, he, uh, I know him pretty well. He's a good guy. He loves me. The devil says, you know him? You, you don't know Job. You have no idea who Job is. You just treat him really well, and he, and he says he loves you. In fact, if you didn't treat him very well, he wouldn't love you at all. And they had this little wager and this bet regarding Job. And the devil decides that he's going to begin to take away some of Job's graces. And the story begins where suddenly the house that Job's children are staying in collapses and all but one of Job's sons are killed. 
Job doesn't understand, cries, and then looks up to the heavens and says, I love you, God. The frustrated devil looks down at the earth, takes away and burns Job's fields. Job says, love you, God. Takes his cattle, his sheep, destroys his cattle, his sheep. Love you, God. Love you, God. Tears, love you, God. Until the devil decides to do one pretty incredible thing. And the Bible describes it as giving Job terrible human suffering. The pictures show Job with boils, with leprosy. For the sake of this audience, let's say it is widely metastatic cancer that Job gets. Job says, I, I, I know you, God. You know me. I love you, but why are you doing this to me? What's up? Why are you doing this to me? I know you. You know me. This is Job. The creator looks down from the heavens. And the reply is interesting. The reply says, Job, I actually thought I knew you. You know me? You know me? How audacious of you. Were you, were you there when I created the heavens and the earth? Maybe I missed that. Were you, were you there? Were you there when I separated the land from the water, when I created the fish, the leviathans, when I... But I didn't, what, do you know me? Job is in that moment transcended. Job says, you know, I, I thought I knew you. But now in fact, I understand you and I see you. The words in Hebrew and ancient Aramaic are I see you. It's interesting, in that relationship, Job suddenly understands completely. And so too does God. It's a two-way relationship. And in that doing, Job stands taller. Somehow, as only Bible can do, Job has new children suddenly appear, and new sheep, and new fields, and there's a good ending to this. But not only anthropologically, spiritually, and by faith, we define relationism. Let's jump ahead some 2,500 years to one of modern day's philosophers, Martin Buber. If Vicky were here, Vicky would call Martin Buber frequently, my guy, my guy, the great German philosopher of the 20th century. Interestingly, one of uh, my fellows in cardiology, Jonathan Buber, the great nephew uh, of the late Martin Buber. Martin Buber would be turning over, I am certain, uh, wherever he is, because you can spend lifetimes thinking about Buber. We're going to talk about Martin Buber in less than five minutes, maybe two to three minutes, Buber in a bottle, if you will. And I apologize uh, to all of us just in terms of understanding how we in palliative care frequently refer uh, to the thoughts uh, and the writings of Martin Buber. Uh, Buber begins really in my mind way before or back in the, in the biblical days in terms of Plato's writings. And I, re, I remember Plato in terms of the forms. Plato defined dualism in terms of everything that we see and we interact with. There is, when we think about a subject or an object, think about a chair, I think to myself about a concept of a chair, the form of a chair. What is a chair? A chair is something that one sits upon that has legs to it, is stable, allows me comfort, and the ability to get off my feet. But in practice, this noble, this unreal, this essence of a chair has practical forms to it. They're not perfect. They have their flaws to them. It's what we see in the everyday real world. And so Plato uses reality versus perfection in terms of dualism. Buber took duality to define our relations, our relations with things and nature, our relations with people, and for Buber also our relations with the eternal. And in terms of looking at this duality, Buber said that we interact in two ways. We interact in an imperfect, tangible, egoistic way, at a very practical level, and we interact in a more ethereal, fully complete, all-giving, all-knowing way one called the I and the it relation, one called the I and the thou relation. Let's explore that a little bit more. When we look at the I-it component, we're interacting with something, 
I'm interacting perhaps with the person, but in their presence now, based upon concepts of my knowing you before. And in fact, it has bounds to it. It's, I am interacting with you for the here and the now. It's a quick interaction. It's governed, as I said, by my past knowledge of you. And primarily, we're trying to manipulate each other, get something accomplished, get something done. It's never with our entire selves. We quickly have that interaction, we let go. The it component of our relations. The thou component has nothing to do with things. It has to do with our very being. It's unbounded by definition. It's in the present, it's here and now and giving of ourselves completely. No ego attached. We're here to grow and we're here to learn from that experience as always with our entirety. And for Buber, this experience defines us. Neither one is better or worse. You know, ultimately for Buber, Buber wanted us to live more in the thou than the it, but Buber recognized that we interact in both of these fashions. And as we interact, we define ourselves through this existence. It is I relate, therefore I am, not like Descartes, I think, therefore I am, but it is my relationship and its components that define us as human beings. We'll burn a few minutes. We'll come back to the I, it, the I, thou, as we think about can we be zipless in palliative care. Relationalism, which Buber began to think philosophically in the early 1920s, had its foundation and its beginning in the arts. And this is Vernon Lee, one of the early aesthetists. In the field of art, the genre of aesthetism had to do with, can you picture yourself relating to a piece of art by throwing yourself completely into that art form, feeling what that piece is, lives and breathes with you. The armchair is there. As you see that armchair, you go into the armchair. You feel its stiffness, you feel its back, you sit a little bit straighter, and you get to know that armchair, and potentially in some fashion, the armchair is relating to you as well. This was the basis of aesthetism. Theodore Lips, the psychologist, took this concept, so a bunch of other philosophers and psychologists at the time, took that concept and translated it out to a term that was in German, ein Fühlen. One feeling, in feeling, what we began to use as the term empathy. You see the definition of empathy at that time from the Oxford English Dictionary, the power of projecting one's personality into the object of contemplation and in so doing fully comprehending that object. I used the term Reader's Digest before. The people in this audience know by hand. You know Reader's Digest? Okay, it's, it dates us. Um, I, I will tell people that Reader's Digest, uh, in many ways, is the early internet. Uh, <laughs> for, for, for many people who couldn't get 20 subscriptions to magazines, you got a bit and a taste of what Reader's Digest editorial staff felt were the most important pieces that came out at the time. It was a monthly journal. I learned medicine through Reader's Digest. I am Bill's toe. I am Joe's foot. It talked about medical issues. But in uh, April of 1955, the tipping point where the word empathy occurred, because they ran an article from the Christian Century, which was a popular magazine at the time, and it was called what? How's Your Empathy? And it's the cover of, of, of that journal. And in that, empathy was described as quite interesting because they took it the next step. The ability to appreciate the other person's feelings and notice the, in italics, without yourself becoming so emotionally involved that your judgment is affected. How important an addition to empathy. Suddenly empathic distress is sort of mitigated, at least in the definition of empathy, whether that occurs in practice or not is a different issue. Let's move from relationism to part two of our discussion, the various components, scientific components, have a little bit of fun in the process uh, of empathy. And we are taught as fellows, and we are taught uh, as palliative care physicians that empathy has three components. 
An affective component is sort of the ABCs or the ACBs. A cognitive component and a behavioral component. Let's examine first the affective component. How are we doing so far, everybody with me? Cool, thank you. The affect component can be best thought about if we think about modeling, to model something in our heads, not model, but model. And it begins with the very assumption and the observation that we, all of us in this room, people, are contagious. We're gonna come back to contagion. First, let's begin to think in our brain how we can model. I uh, was, did poorly, let's put it that way, in neuroanatomy. And so we're gonna be very basic uh, in terms of our modeling of the human brain. The ancient primitive human brain go back 300 million years to the age of reptiles. And reptiles only had this portion of the human brain. I didn't highlight the one right behind it, but there are two portions there, both of the central portion of the brain and the cerebellum, the brain stem and the cerebellum. Notice I forgot there, it shows you my neuroanatomy knowledge. I had to get the, the clue and the prompt. This is what told reptiles, you need to survive, you need to move, you need to have basic functions of your body, heart function, lung function. Wasn't a lot of room for empathy with these portions of the brain. I'm gonna recreate briefly for you what life was like back in the days of reptiles. <laughs> There's not a lot going on there in terms of thinking about what happens to the next person, your kin, your children. It's about survival. Jump ahead some 35 million years to the creation of mammals. We have a whole different brain that evolves. And we certainly have need within mammals of parental bonding development of loyalty, affiliation, parental nurturing, protection, and care. And we have that portion in orange of the brain called the cingulate gyrus, the limbic system, limbic from line, in terms of demarcation, from lumen, enlightenment. We suddenly now have another portion of our brain that will be critical and key when we think about empathy. We'll look at where cerebral blood flow happens when we have empathic and modeling feelings. And then as we develop further to a paltry few million years, the development of people, human beings, we have the development of the neocortex. Human beings and to be clear, apes, monkeys. And this is the part of the brain that allows us to be smart, allows us to have symbolic representation, to think, to imagine, to reason, to process, have mathematics, physics, technology, invention. And we'll see that the neocortex allows us to cognate over what we see and to adapt, to pivot, and to make changes in terms of our empathic responses. Let's go back to that observation, behavior is contagious. Think about it. <sighs> Spreads. <laughs> From one person to another across species, odds are that if we were to watch each other in this room, one, two, five people over a 20 second period of time would begin to yawn. It happens. Behavior is contagious. Here's another behavior. This is Raiders of the Lost Ark. You're going to watch the, oh, the young alpha is standing in the middle. Now watch the smile. If you smile, his smile. Emotions and behavior are contagious. If you look at this woman's emotion, this smile, it's an anti-gravity event. It's not quite the upturning of the forehead, which tells you true happiness, but it's a pretty good smile. It's hard not to feel happy when you see this young woman. Emotions are contagious. Don't be too proud of this technological Holmes terror you have constructed. The ability to destroy a planet is Dark insignificant Dark. next to the power of people the force. walking out of the movie theater. Speak lower. People have tested this. When you hear Darth Vader's voice, we suddenly start speaking like this. My voice is low enough. Uh, before Daniel Craig, there were other James Bonds, Sean Connery. This is called the Dr. No effect. A tarantula crawls up James Bond's arm from under the covers where James is with some other person as usual in the movies. 
and suddenly he's afraid, but the audience starts doing this, looking at their arm, feeling something crawling up their arm. Feelings and sensations are contagious. So let's ask, why, in fact, our actions, our sensations, our tone of voice, our emotions contagious? Why do they jump from one person to the next? And if our, in fact, the answer is that we understand things by creating models. We run a model in our head when we see things, when we hear things, when we feel things. This is a cerebral blood flow study, and we'll see a few of them here, not for the necessarily the exact science, but to show and to describe to us what may be going on. This is somebody sitting in a scanner. I stroke their leg, their left leg lightly, their right leg lightly. A portion of the brain lights up in terms of flow, the primary and the secondary somatosensory cortex. We call it that name. Then I take somebody and I have them watch that person. And what's fascinating is the same areas of the brain light up, perhaps to a lesser extent. We create a model using the same hardware inside our brain when we watch the so-called mirror neuron phenomenon occurs when someone's being touched. Not just touch, emotion. You watch someone be happy and the primary motor, the premotor cortex, the right central cortex light up in the person who's having the emotion as well as in us perhaps to a lesser extent when we're watching that emotion happen. I take a probe, how awful. I take a probe that's hot and I touch it lightly to, the, to someone's back and the anterior cingulate gyrus, remember the cingulate gyrus as part of the development of mammals, lights up. And then if I watch someone have that same heat probe put onto them, the same area lights up. We experience pain by modeling. And in fact, we model pain in a different way. I want you to look at these different examples and see the subtle difference. I take a group of phenomenon here that have the potential to be painful, but in fact, they're not. These are the pleasant forms of what people will see. They will see in the top, someone opening and having their hand near a door, cutting a cucumber, having their loose foot near a door, entering a car in a sandal, something that we don't wear to work here in the hospitals. Or show them the painful version, getting their fingers caught in the door, cutting the finger, ouch, been there, when one has a cutting of a cucumber, getting the foot caught in the door of a regular door or the car door. And when we show the pleasant versions, nothing lights up in the brain, but when we show the pictures of someone having pain, the same anterior cingulate gyrus lights up because we feel, we experience, and we understand by creating a model, the mirror neurons fire. I grew up with this man as my president, and his catchphrase was what? I feel your pain. Ah, I feel your... If, in fact, the president was able to do that, we could assume that he had a very active anterior cingulate gyrus, right? He was able to model other people's pains. I don't know that, in fact, that occurred. I want you in the, in the next slide, the next movie, uh, which is perhaps humorous. It's one of the great movies of all time. Uh, rates up there with Gone with the Wind, Classics, Dr. Zhivago, it's Austin Powers uh, is the movie. And in this scene, I want you to see what happens when pain occurs and how pain is modeled as the, one of the protagonists, uh, one of the actors gets hit in the groin. <laughs> Release the meteor! Release the meteor! Oh! in a Kanyigin. God damn it! Oh! oh. Guys! Oh. Way to go, a-hole! All right, hold on. Will I try and... All right. The, I cut out certain portions there. Uh, it was uh, awful enough. But notice that there was modeling. So the event happens, others... And I have to tell you, I've watched this clip a uh, hundred times. Uh, and each time I do this, it is almost instinctive to people with Y chromosomes that we do this. Uh, but notice even the woman did this. And we all model 
the painful event that happens. It's interesting, not only in the occurrence do we prove the existence of these mirror neurons, but one of the emotional sites of mirroring, which we see here in the anterior temporal lobe, if we take disease states, or in fact we have degeneration of those areas, and we look to see if one can maintain and sustain emotional empathy, it turns out that people that have disease where they lose those components no longer can empathize quite the same way, and we see this lesser cerebral blood flow in those areas. And certain primary sociologic states, sociopaths, lose components of blood flow to those areas that are notable, noted with empathy. So that first component of empathy, the A, the affect, to, to be able to mirror and to model emotions is important for us. We take in the sensation when we observe people. The cognitive portion, let's talk about the cognitive portion. And the cognitive portion is in fact uh, what you see on the bottom of the screen there, moving from not just experiencing it ourselves, but looking at it from another perspective. I am seeing it occurring in you. It's not just me experiencing this, but it's me trying to experience what you're feeling for you in the audience from an other perspective. And imagine here, not only do we see the experience, but we take the perspective of being away and looking back at the person or ourselves having that emotion. Interesting example. I tell us in the audience, I say, okay, imagine yourself in a different spot. Our brain lights up in one particular area. Then I ask us something different. Imagine that you're over there looking back. You're in that other spot, but you're looking back at yourself. A totally different portion of the brain lights up. Taking a different perspective and looking backwards is a different area of the brain. Two different examples of a very similar action. Imagine here's a person who walks behind a bookcase versus here's a person walks behind the bookcase, stay there for, stays there for a little bit of time, lingers, and then continues to move forward. The first example of the, of the person walking behind the bookcase is the bottom screen. The area where we have other orientation doesn't light up. But when the person lingers and stays behind that area, the posterior superior temporal sulcus lights up. Why does that happen? Person stops back there, we think to ourselves, hmm, Wonder where they are. Wonder what they're doing back there. Why did they stop behind the bookcase? What's back there? Wonder what it feels like to be back there. I wonder what view they have. What's behind the bookshelf? And we put ourselves into that space. Shown again, if I say to us, imagine an occurrence that happens. Imagine the classic, a tree falls in the forest. Imagine the tree falling. An area doesn't light up. But if I say something different, imagine you're in a movie theater. Some big tall guy with a big nose just happens to walk in front of you and sit right in front of you. Just imagine that happening. The area lights up. Because we say to ourselves, the person just sat there, just stood up there. I wonder what they're, wonder what they're seeing that I'm not seeing. Why would they do that? What does it look like over there? We put ourselves into the perspective of the other. Posterior superior temporal sulcus. It's interesting, that same area lights up not just for action, not just for contemplation of an action, but in terms of emotion. This is the classic theory of mind, trying to understand someone's emotions. We see someone's face, right? You see this face, and if I gave you various options, if I said, is this man excited, relieved, shy, despondent, most of us would say, despondent, right? We, we look, we try to project what is that emotion? What are they feeling? Take the other orientation. Posterior superior temporal lobe lights up in terms of cerebral blood flow. So we've talked about a couple of components, the affective and the cognitive components of behavior. Let's briefly talk about the behavioral component of behavior. And some of the great classicists 
of modern day thought with regard to empathy. And you see there Jody Halpern, Franz Dirksen, Jean de Cidi have all commented that empathy without action it doesn't exist. That's not empathy. One needs to have the actionable components of understanding and feeling what somebody else feels, potentially in a therapeutic fashion, but that wasn't part of the deal when we talked about behavior. Behavioral component of empathy is what we as fellows learn for the entire year. And whether we call it nursing someone in terms of understanding emotions, naming, understanding, respecting, supporting, exploring, that's the verbal component of our behavior. Or if it's the non-verbal portion of what we do, how we stand, sitting here before you, standing squarely, open body posture, leaning into you, not too much, leaning in, using our eye contact, keeping ourselves somewhat relaxed. Interesting, both of those studied in randomized, controlled fashion by James and colleagues, 2011, in the literature, we'll see that reference come up. And Helen Reese putting it all together here at this institution and using the wonderful name, Empathy. We'll come back to her book later, 2018. Great read for the lay public. But taking both verbal and nonverbal ability to be able to behave and understand what somebody else is feeling. And in essence, when most people write about this third component of empathy, that's where they leave it. They talk about how we should behave to understand and get these feelings to mirror and to cognate and reflect backwards from the other orientation. These are the two randomized controlled trials that looked at these means. For the recognition suddenly thereafter that there is adversity on occasion after one has achieved their goals. If I only had affective, if I only had cognitive, if I only had behavioral components of empathy and I mastered those, I might feel very happy. But I would tell you, we're still at considerable risk. I want to think about those risks and one can literally freeze if one doesn't think carefully and practice carefully in terms of empathy. I'm gonna briefly just mention before I get into some of the others, this concept of empathic distress, which for the sake of this audience, I'm gonna to briefly touch on, but I'm gonna say that if we behave in a different fashion, distress is mitigated. But distress, living in the emotion has been shown in scientific study after scientific study, that if we sit there with the negative, if we envelop the negative, when we are asked to do structural tasks, logical tasks, we perform poorly and under the way that we would have performed otherwise. So we don't get locked in the negative and we develop ways with our empathy in a therapeutic fashion to avoid that distress. Let's look at other negatives of empathy. Wonderful book that you see at the bottom, Against Empathy, The Case for Rational Compassion. Why one shouldn't be empathic. Paul Bloom writes about it. In fact, he doesn't really say you shouldn't be empathic. Here are the risks of unmitigated empathy. Spotlight effect. I see what I see. Near field effect. Someone comes to me and comes to you saying I have pain and you explore their pain with them and you listen to their narrative and you hear about the physical component of their pain and that's all that they speak about and all that you elicit. That is the world that you envision. You don't hear the existential, you don't hear the spiritual, you don't hear the sociologic components of their pain. You focus on what's in front of you with the potential for losing everything else. Short-term bias. We had a wonderful Grand Rounds not too long ago with regard to the long-term effects of opioids. Someone comes to us and says, I have pain, I have physical, visceral, somatic, nociceptive pain, and I treat them with an opioid, and I treat them for years, if not decades, because they talk about their pain now. And I haven't explored the fact that they need and want, and biologically it's critically important for them to have children, and I don't think about their reproductive potential and the testosterone changes that are occurring. I'm only thinking about the short term, not necessarily the impact of the long term effects of what I'm doing. 
potentially empathy focuses you on the here and now. Tribal bias. This is a long recognized uh, issue uh, described as you see there by Tanya Singer and others. We feel more for people that were like my tribe, Judaism, we feel more for each other. It could be any faith, any persons. Men feel more for men, women more for women. It happens. And if we don't recognize it and be open to that effect, we can become biased. Judgmentalism. We take in, we do our very best to be open, to understand, to be curious. And no matter what, if somebody has put the needle into their arm, and has a secondary infection, immune compromise, if somebody has stolen, cheated, the patient I was called to yesterday in consultation who is the offender sexually and the team had distress over the entire care of the patient, neglecting necessarily the fact he was there with cancer pain. We have judgmentalism that can potentially affect our empathy. We just need to recognize that. Empathy can be morally corrosive. What do I mean by that? It doesn't seem that that's correct. Perhaps not correct for the particular individual, but think about it. We can connect with a person in such a way that it can shift our perspective on a much more global moral dilemma. Imagine if you will forgive the example here. That if I sit with this person and I see this interaction, I think about that loving interaction by the surface from some great pictures that we're taking of the, of the Fuhrer. I might think about this as a kind and decent and gentle man in his interactions, neglecting the greater moral picture that was involved with the entirety of the Holocaust. We have that potential by the snapshot to lose moral balance. I'm sure all of you are familiar with uh, the philosopher Paul Michel Foucault. Not, uh, I wasn't. Uh, we can say that empathy in some ways is Foucauldian. What do I mean by that? Foucault talked about all of life and all of sociology and all of events of history occurring because of power struggles. And we don't think about it, but we need to recognize our relationship as care providers is one based upon power. We, we do this, we may not instinctively think about it, but the example that was used in discussions, this is Chris Mays discussing it with, with regard to patient-centered care, where we think that we equate everybody. We don't, we don't equate in our business, we don't do that. The care provider, when it comes to empathy, can be thought about as listening to a patient's confession. We elicit the narrative, but they're confessing and telling to us. And in such a fashion, we try to create a therapeutic environment where we allow our therapy to be felt and complied with by the patient. And in so doing, we appear virtuous. There is a power relationship that has potential to occur. We do our best to mitigate it, but we need to at least be aware of it. Last example of the potential evils, negative effects of empathy for us. Empathy can certainly be morally neutral. Uh, it doesn't have to be used for moral goodness or moral badness but it can be used uh, in the setting of moral badness. And the example that I love with regard to this is that who has the greatest cognitive aspects of empathy? Sociopaths, torturers, con men, bullies. They also go really high in empathic scales of cognitive empathy. There was a book I read growing up. Uh, the movie was in the what, late 1990s. Uh, it's 1984, George Orwell's uh, vision of utopian society. Big Brother is watching, uh, where there's mind control that goes on uh, to all of us. The great Richard Burton played a character, O'Brien, who was an agent of the state. Here, uh, John Hurt uh, plays the, the main character, Winston Smith. And O'Brien, the agent of the state, is able to empathize completely with Smith, understand everything in his head. Here you see him controlling Smith, the cage, the room 101 that's around his head. Smith's total and complete nightmare of rats ready to attack him. It's quite moving. But the book says the following. 
in describing O'Brien's relationship with Smith, there was no idea that he ever had or could have that O'Brien had not long ago known, examined, rejected. His mind contained Winston's mind. And O'Brien says to Winston, do you remember writing in your diary that, in fact, it didn't matter whether I was a friend of yours or an enemy? Since I was at least a person you could who could understand you and you could talk to. The feeling of wanting to be empathized with, but used to the forces of, uh, of evil, sociopaths, con men. Let's come back to the three components, affective, behavioral, and cognitive. If left by themselves, I, I say that we've given our patients a, an insufficient check, a check that bounces, that's not enough. And in fact, there are two more components which are critical. The relationship needs to be both therapeutic, and just like in the I it and the I thou, it needs to be bi-directional. I need to define myself through that relationship, and the patient that we're taking care of is defined backwards and gets something from me at the same time. And we give of ourselves completely in some fashion, but we also give ourselves in a manipulative fashion as we're being therapeutic. Helen Reese talked about afferent and efferent limbs of empathy. We have our I it and our I thou, and we give of ourselves, we learn from the patient, we experience, we have the affective components, we have the cognitive components, some behavioral components, and then as we turn it back to therapy, we think about what will be in the patient's best interest, and we release back potentially in a manipulative fashion for the brief periods of time, in a bounded fashion, the I-it component of our relationship. In so doing, empathy combines the ABCs, the ACBs, and adds action and therapy to that. Yes, it does have the potential for empathic distress, but if we recognize the afferent and efferent limbs, we control how much emotion we leave and contain within ourselves. It's different than sympathy. Sympathy is different because it takes the emotions that we feel, the affect that we feel, and we react to it. We keep it in ourselves. We don't necessarily process it. We may choose to do something, but it's about ourselves and sympathy in ourselves and that feeling that we have that we're left with and it's high risk for the practitioner. Compassion is interesting. We don't ruminate a lot about compassion. We feel what somebody else feels. We don't necessarily reflect about it. We may. We don't necessarily take action. And this too places us potentially at risk for distress. The key difference, empathy, reflection, other orientation, and action thereafter. Therapeutic empathy. And so I'm gonna leave us with the question for the remaining minutes. Can we truly be Zipless? Remember what Zipless was defined in the good work that we try to do as palliative care clinicians. Can we have an interaction with the patients that ask us to be there to support them and to help heal them from their suffering for its own sake, without ulterior motive, without commitment, long-term commitment, without emotional involvement between otherwise unacquainted parties? I, I don't know the right answer. I spent decades of my prior life diving deeply and staying deep, developing relationships with patients that I didn't walk from taking phone calls at midnight at two in the morning from patients over time, in many ways incorrectly suffering with them. And as I entered into palliative care fellowship, I was guided, I, I believe correctly in many ways, that there are different relationships. There are deep dives that are quick and deep, and then we come out. We need to give space to the patient to heal and stay in their world, but we need to do the good work that we do here and walk away and learn how to walk away in that very deep, very quick, very aware fashion. We remain at risk. 
one of my favorite characters of all time, Patch Adams, or the comedian who played Patch Adams. Deep, incredibly deep relationships, but the comedian shows you that that deep relationship of one isn't careful is at risk of tremendous distress. I, I do believe that we have the potential to be zipless. I'd love to know what this audience believes and audiences that are listening to us believe. And as I end, I want to thank a bunch of people. Uh, in particular, first of all, thank you for coming along with this ride with me, the train ride, if you will. Uh, I want to thank my co-fellows in particular. Uh, there's been a few things that have been more fun than to join uh, a group of 28 to 35 year olds again. Um, and to be accepted uh, and to be loved uh, and to share. Uh, I know a few people that have greater potential, uh, who have greater skills, I wish. Uh, I had the abilities that my colleagues have. To my clinic preceptors who have taken me on, Juliet in the audience, James, uh, I think in the other audience over at Dana-Farber, for uh, teaching me and showing me by modeling uh, and allowing me to ruminate with regard to that. To my ward preceptors, Janet, uh, and others who have watched me uh, and have guided me, everyone in the back as well. Uh, to the program directors and to the program chairs who have taken some risk in allowing me to join in and to all of you uh, for examining this question with me. I would love to hear people's thoughts. Uh, I thank you for the past 45, 50 minutes uh, and I look forward to spending a lifetime with you all uh, and learning from you all. Thank you. I'm just going to repeat that for the folks at Dana Farber. So we don't have another uh, microphone. So if people have questions, if you can raise your hand, I will repeat the question so that everybody can hear it. Uh, so, I'm going to have you, Mike, can you summarize sure. if that's okay. And then, you know, maybe I can, once you're done, then I can bring that around Thank to you. questions. The, uh, the good Dr. Taylor uh, has uh, reflected that we can't always just be nice to patients. Uh, the reflection that one of your early mentors gave to you and people have shared with me as well. And I think it's quite remarkable. Uh, I remember when I spoke with Juliet uh, early in this year, and I said, Juliet, I think I'm going to talk about empathy at Grand Rounds. And I actually said something different. I said, I, I'm going to talk about the inauthenticity uh, of empathy. And Juliet looked at me and said, what? And, and I said, you know, it, it's, a, it's a fine line here that we have to gauge how we interact with patients. They're expecting us to be therapeutic. We need to be able to intake and the initial desire is to, to be kind and gentle. That's what many of our personalities are, but we need to be therapeutic. We need to be balanced. We need to be able to accept and we need to be able to do the good work that we do. When we're surprised, we need to be surprised. We need to show that if it's in the therapeutic benefit of our patients. And so I think, yes, we have to think about our emotions and how we display them. It takes a lot of work to be able to do that. It's not natural to all of us and, that, and hence, I don't want to use that word inauthenticity to, to mean fake amoral. I just mean it to be therapeutic in terms of how we gauge and choose to use our faces, our postures. You know, when we're told take on a certain posture, it's not natural to sit here like this, wide open like, like this to everybody, but we learn to do that to be approachable 
so that people can give back to us in that short, relatively quick time. Thank you, Dr. Keller. Mike, that was outstanding, and I want to thank you for the, the thoughtful ideas that you've given me in this. The question I have, could you comment, a lot of us who've been doing this for a number of years um, make jokes about the forgetting, that we will have very close, meaningful interactions with patients and forget almost everything. Um, and it, you know, it, it can come back as a chunk, but it is a component that um, happens over time, I think. And I wondered what your thoughts are in this context of, of what it means to be empathic. So uh, Dr. Jacobson uh, asks about our selective choice for, uh, for those of us that are 58, 59 years old, maybe not selective, just neurons <laughs> not, not, not retaining quite the same uh, in terms of forgetting. Um, I'm going to use an example, a bit of a shocking example, and then uh, perhaps reflect uh, on that. Uh, I have a cousin, I had a cousin, a first cousin, who had an eidetic memory, a uh, photographic memory. Uh, and my cousin Neil uh, was one of the earliest graduates, uh, youngest graduates from Princeton, uh, graduated age 15 or age 16, could remember everything that was in a textbook, everything, uh, what was on the fourth leaf of the second branch of that tree that he passed. And Neil's problem was that he couldn't selectively choose to remember. He remembered everything. Uh, and he couldn't compartmentalize and everything flooded his brain uh, and it just sort of sat there and it sat and it raged inside of him. And, and my cousin, who is now my late cousin, uh, chose like uh, one of the comedians and actors that we saw to end his life uh, because it was unbearable for him. I, I think we, I use it as an example, but I reflect on it because I think we choose to forget. Now that's a psychological way of, of thinking about that. I, I think that it is uh, a way for us to move to the next patient in many ways uh, and not to carry with us uh, the negatives. And you, you may say, well, what about the positives? Uh, and do we tend to forget all of them? I don't know the answer to that. It is my simple reflection uh, with regard to that. I don't fully know. I'd love to hear what others think, but I, I think it is a survival advantage uh, to be able to do that uh, with some very limited reflection. Can I throw a question back to the audience? Would that be all right? Um, and it's the very question that I raised. Um, can, we, can we do this? Um, is it a combination uh, that truly is, and I hate the term, but I like the term also, it's not the sexual term, but can we stay in fact, zipless, can we give ourselves completely, get in and fully get out and not be attached? Because I think we feel attached, and maybe this was a question, Juliet, that you were saying in the forgetting, do we feel that we no longer are attached to the people that we came to so deeply res respect? I think this idea can be found in a lot of philosophies. Buddhism comes to mind of non-attachment, where you can be in the moment and fully with someone, um, and then when you leave, leave that behind. And it, leave behind is not even really the right word because it remains with you, but just not, um, uh, you know, so present in your in your mind and in your being. You know, when the Dalai Lama greets somebody, he puts his head forehead to their forehead, and he is with that person fully in that moment. Or at least that's the experience of people who've met him. I have not. Um, and then he moves to the next person, and whether it's sadness or regret or happiness that that person has, and, and I think I think. I finish that, that ability to, to have that I thou relationship or that non attachment requires tremendous discipline and practice. And it's a kind of much higher order skill than, um, than we have, certainly when we're fellows and after 10 years of practice. But I think ultimately that's the ideal place to get to where you can do that deep dive, be there, be present with the happiness, the misery, the anger, the regret 
and then leave it behind when you leave. Out of, out of fairness to everybody, I, uh, perhaps I, I should say thank you to everyone. I know that I've taken from your busy days, you have great work to do. Uh, I know that I have to go back to be on the consult service. Uh, <laughs> thank you again for the opportunity, for allowing me to reflect uh, and to share with you today. And I wish everybody an incredible and a meaningful day and, and rest of your time. Thank you.